Good morning, Bucknutters. Welcome to the Bucknuts Morning 5 here on November 3rd, 2021. I am Dave Biddle. I am very happy joined by the people's champ, Matt Baxendale. Man, that's some good news. Bax and I are actually recording this show right after the college football playoff rankings were announced last night. Man, I was expecting the Buckeyes to be number seven. I agree they should be number five. I was not expecting that. What a pleasant surprise, Bax. When and we are in, period. You look at the way it sets up ahead of Ohio State, one of the top two is going to likely take a loss against each other, and Ohio State is a head-to-head with Michigan State left. So if the Buckeyes beat the Spartans and went out, they're in. There's no debate about it at this point. Uh, I don't know if there really was a lot of concern before this, but Ohio State's path is very clear. And it's interesting because I did not expect this to end the way it did. Bama at two surprises me a bit because I don't really know what they've done um, other than struggle with a 500 Florida team and lose to Texas A&M and who have they beat. So that part's interesting. But other than that, you know, Michigan State's being rewarded for being undefeated as it should. They're ranking the, the undefeated Big Ten team right behind the two SEC teams. Oregon's in on the strength of their win over an Ohio State team that they literally called terrific when they were talking to Gary Barta. And then after that, I mean, Cincinnati's not going to get in at this point. It's extremely <laughs> unlikely, at least, that they're going to get in. They need Oregon and Oklahoma to lose a couple games here to make that even of a prayer. And meanwhile, you've got the Wolverines hovering in like uh, what seventh or eighth was where they were. So that's a really good sign for OSU that they're going to have a chance to potentially get two more top 10 wins. They're in if they went out, guys, plain and simple. This is a really good playoff bracket for OSU. My only question is, how does this end up with us playing uh, Clemson in the semifinal? Because that's always what seems to happen lately. Yeah, good luck with that fighting Dabos. That's not going to happen this year. What was your biggest surprise? Uh, I mean, maybe it was Ohio State being fifth. I think you and I both agree they should be uh, in that spot where uh, went out and they're in. And as you said, if they went out, they're definitely in. What was your biggest surprise from the rankings? Was it Ohio State being fifth, Cincinnati sixth, Alabama second, Oklahoma eighth? That jumped out to me. What was your biggest surprise? Oregon fourth, right? That has to be Oregon, because what have they done outside of that road win at OSU, which is the entire reason they're in the top four right pretty now. Pretty damn good win. Yeah, pretty big win. Pretty big win. Other than that, they have looked putrid. They've lost to Stanford in an ugly game. They've nearly lost a couple more. Um, that's a really big surprise to me, because I figured Oklahoma would get default credit for having having the record that they do right now in a supposed major conference. Um, Oklahoma is the second biggest surprise because if you look at them, that's the committee saying fool's gold. You're about to lose one of these games. You guys suck. You're lucky to be there. <laughs> like the Oklahoma ranking is such utter disrespect. Cause they're like, look, we don't think since he's legit, right. But we really don't think you're legit. So good for them. I guess that uh, since he gets credit for being better in Oklahoma right now, um, I would have expected since to be higher, but you know, the, the committee seems to be looking at this as a mix of results and power ranking. Right. Like, that's what this is, is they're like, well, Georgia's number one on all facets. We think Bama will beat everybody else. Michigan State's undefeated. So we'll give them results credit. Uh, Oregon beat Ohio State. So they have to be ahead of them because they both have one loss. Then it's Ohio State who would thump everybody else on this list. Put Cincy there because they're undefeated. Nice story. And then we'll put Michigan in because they just played a really tight game with the number three team. And then after that, who else is left? Oklahoma. All right, fine. They sort of, they suck. They're going to fall down. Put them there for now. This is going to change. That's like literally their thought process in 20 seconds. And that's cool by me because it seems like they're very clearly high on Ohio State. And they showed a lot of respect to the Big Ten. I didn't expect that either. And did you did you notice uh, 20 through 22? We got Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa. They're basically saying whoever wins the Big Ten West, that team will be ranked. That's another quality win Ohio State um, could potentially get. Although, again, like you said, it doesn't even matter at this point. If Ohio State wins, they're in. Maybe seeding will matter, so I shouldn't say it wouldn't matter, but I found it interesting and encouraging that the committee showed more respect toward the Big Ten than I expected. I think the Big Ten this year is – I said this with Dan on, on Sunday after the um, 
after after the the way that we saw Ohio State kind of you know go through its season with a loss, but didn't really seem to hurt them in the eyes of the public, and all these Big Ten teams that are rising up and down, Iowa is a classic SEC top ten win. And by that I mean they started off in the top ten. They got a win that you were like, really? But they still held on because they beat another team that was kind of flawed, but they were both top ten. Remember that. And then they lost a couple games. But people are going to still look back at it and go, that's a top 10 Iowa team, right? They're getting the SEC preseason bump here all of a sudden. I don't know if this is the powers that be uh, at ESPN trying to make the Big Ten feel better about themselves before the TV deals are up or whatever. But the Big Ten this year is getting some serious respect. I think everybody looks at the SEC and goes, it's a two-team league right now. Whereas the Big Ten has, it's almost like this is a flip of where we were 10, 15 years ago, where you had OSU, you had another school, usually Michigan or Penn State, that was the number two, and then everybody else sucked. Meanwhile, the SEC had seven or eight really good teams, right? And that's flipped this year. The Big Ten has a bunch of really good teams, and the SEC has two teams, and then everybody else largely sucks, right? So this is a weird year, but the Big Ten, and they're getting a ton of respect for the results they've had on the field. And I have to say, it's kind of nice. Like, we've we've been sort of, you know, throwing the middle finger up at the powers that be for a long time, but Getting this kind of cushion as just, yeah, the Big Ten's a really strong league. I don't know how to react to this. It's, it's, it's like having fought tooth and nail for everything your whole life, and all of a sudden you walk into a golden palace of everything you've ever dreamed of. It's so weird. But the Big Ten right now has probably more respect than any other conference in the country if you look at the way the college football rankings are right now with the committee. Yeah, I mean, other than the SEC, I mean, you give Alabama the number two ranking in the country despite losing to AM, who they put 14th. And I get it. As I said on the board, people are like, well, this and that about Alabama. How does Alabama get the benefit of the doubt? And listen, I don't like it. They're Alabama. Like it That's how. Because they're Alabama. They, they've won like <laughs> they've won like 3,000 national championships since, since Saban has taken over. Like they get the benefit of the doubt. They've earned that. So I don't like it, but Alabama has earned that. So they've given the SEC a ton of respect. Um, as expected, uh, I did not expect the Big Ten getting this much respect. As I said, the one exception in the Big Ten, this surprised me because um, I pre-wrote my story for the site and I had Penn State in the top 25. I, I didn't know where they'd be, but I thought they'd be in the top 25 for sure. No Penn State in the top 25. There's only one three loss team in the top 25. That's Mississippi State. What do you make of that? I, I was surprised Penn State was not in the top 25. I think it's just a byproduct of who beat who among that whole lower echelon of teams, right? Remember, Iowa beat Penn State. Iowa lost to, with what, Wisconsin, right? Or was it Minnesota, whoever they lost to recently here? I mean, then they lost to Purdue. I, at the end of the day, you know, there's a whole hodgepodge of Big Ten teams that could fit in that spot. I do agree with you, though. I think Penn State is suffering here from the fact that they lost to Illinois. And everybody knows Illinois is kind of not very good at football. The Penn State team that played Ohio State tight on the road last week was – better than top 25 they might have been top 15 with the way that Penn State defense played like as frustrated as we were after the game you have to give Penn State credit but and Penn State's loss at Iowa is very easily explainable as they lost to a top 10 team remember this is an SEC argument here they lost to a top 10 team and their quarterback got hurt if they hadn't lost that joker of a game to Illinois they'd probably be in the top 15 right now but when you drop down to a third loss a fourth loss it all kind of fuzzes together right it's sort of a miasma of not quite mediocrity. So, you know what? The rest of those Big Ten teams that snuck in the bottom, great by us. Uh, it is what it is. It could have been any of a couple of them, to be real honest. Switching gears from the CFP rankings, that stuff will play itself out. And as we know now, if the Buckeyes went out, they're in. Bam. Let's talk about the team itself. I asked Ryan Day uh, you know, about the C.J. Stroud running the football situation. And again, no one – think cj stroud needs to run the ball like 10 times a game and we know he's not justin fields but i see a complete lack of you know willingness to run the ball when he scrambles and and i get it i mean he's got the best wide receiving core in ohio state history and he's a gifted passer i get it you want him to be pass first but man nothing breaks a defense back more than when they have everything covered and, and you get a cheap first down and then you can use your weapons after that we're not seeing him scramble much and we're not seeing any called quarterback runs. The defense is able to completely focus on the running back. Um, you know, I thought Ryan Day gave an okay answer. He, he kind of talked around it. I'm curious where you come down on that with C.J. Stroud. Are, are you concerned about that? I tend to think backs, they need him to scramble a little bit. 
one or two times per game and get a first down. And they need to mix in some called quarterback runs. Again, maybe two or three times per game. Not a lot. That's my opinion. What's your take? My take is they have a shot caller on him. And anytime he gets within a line, the yard of the line of scrimmage, Ryan Day zaps him and Stroud looks up and throws the ball as quick as he can. Um, no, I, I, I honestly, if you want my honest assessment of what Ryan Day is, is thinking and what's going on with C.J. Stroud, I think Ryan Day has flat out told him, I don't want you running the football. I want you saving your bullets for later on in the season. And I think in Ryan Day's eyes, there is such a gap between one and two that he does not want to risk his one unless he absolutely has to when we get down to brass tacks. Um, I also think that as glaring as it has become at times, it's almost a self-scout that you remember how Trevor Lawrence randomly ran for 100 yards in Ohio State in the uh, the semifinal a couple of years ago. No, I don't remember. I don't remember that game at all. What are you even talking about? What? No. Yeah, yeah, that game. That game Frank still the worst Collar, Ohio Frank State Collar. experience of my life. But Trevor Lawrence, the whole season never ran. It was sort of like this. Like the Trevor Lawrence, if you know the history of him, his first game he started right after Kelly Bryant transferred. He tried running and scrambling at like the end of the first half and took a concussion and Clemson almost lost that game because of it. And then Lawrence didn't run again for like a season and a half until they know it's you game essentially. Right. And I think Ryan day for all of us who think Kyle McCord is excellent and would do perfectly fine. I don't think Ryan day agrees with the way he has carried his team, which is the way he forced an injured Stroud on the field at the start of the year when everybody could tell Stroud was hurt. Um, and with the way that Stroud Runs He had one play against Penn State. He literally ran to the line of scrimmage and then flicked like a little half-ass pass to Mayan Williams. Williams nearly fumbled because he barely got it before he got leveled. And Stroud could have ran for five yards and slid and it would have been totally fine. So I think they've literally just drilled into CJ's head. We do not want you running, period. Do not run the ball, period. We want you not taking hits, period. And I think that's because in Ryan Day's eye, the only answer is he thinks that there's such a gulf between one and two, he can't risk one until the Everything is on the line and it's time to go. And that probably means Michigan State, Michigan, Big Ten Championship playoffs, right? These games to Ryan Day, the next couple, Stroud won't run the ball again. That's the only answer I can give you as to why Stroud is so reluctant to run the ball. Because otherwise we're questioning his toughness or his character. And I don't think that's remotely fair to the player. To me, it literally seems like a light bulb comes on when he's a yard away from running. And he goes, oh, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. And I think that's a byproduct of coaching. Yeah, there's no doubt he's tough. You cannot be the starting quarterback at Ohio State if you're not a tough young man. There's no doubt about that. All right, last thing, Ohio State at Nebraska this Saturday, high noon. Now, the thing about Nebraska is their record is terrible. They're three and six, but every one of their losses is by one score. It's like a Scott Frost type thing. That's what he does. He loses by one score. This makes them dangerous. At one point, they're going to win one of these one-score games. You know, I don't think it's going to be this week, but I do like the Bill Parcells quote. You know, you are what your record is. I think Nebraska is the exception to that. They're going to be up for this game. I'm glad, backs. it's a noon game, 11 a.m. local in Lincoln. I think that helps the Buckeyes a little bit. And for some reason, Ohio State tends to play better on the road in most cases. I don't know what the deal is with that lately, but – your thoughts on this game. The Buckeyes are favored by 15. They were favored by 19 and a half against Penn State. They're favored by 15 in this one. Your thoughts on this matchup? I think Penn State's a way better football team than Nebraska. <laughs> Let's start with that. Um, I think Nebraska would be very short-sighted to get rid of Scott Frost after what is clearly going to be a losing season. I say that because every year in college football, there's always one of these teams that the year before lost a bunch of games by a touchdown or less. And then the next year they go on and they win eight or nine games. And it's just, they've had some really bad luck. There's Nebraska finds a way to frost it up every time. And I don't <laughs> think it's necessarily Frost's coaching. I think he's the most snake bitten coach ever. And if Nebraska can stay patient, he might actually be able to turn that thing into a legit thing. There's never been a bigger dichotomy between the narrative of a coach's arrival and the results on the field though, than Scott Frost. That all said, Ohio State is so much better than Nebraska, right? I think Ohio State is the best team in the Big Ten with a bullet. And, you know, Nebraska has lost some tight games. So like, they, like the Michigan game, they probably should have won. All their losses, they probably should have won, to be honest. And I just think Ohio State's got too much talent for Nebraska to deal with it. And, and we've seen this before where Nebraska has a, a, a home advantage, right, where their fans are all into it. 
but it's not a night game. And honestly, Ohio State coming off of a tough Penn State game, I think they're going to be re-examining themselves a little bit. There's, there's no trap here, right? They just want a tight game against Penn State in an atmosphere where I think everybody expected them to throttle Penn State. And that may have been a bit of a mental reset for these guys saying, okay, we're not as good as we thought we were coming into that game. We got out of it with a W. Let's refocus. And to me, this if this team's as good as we think it is, this is going to be one of those Death Star games where Ohio State comes out and goes, we're not messing around this week, and just thumps them right out of the gates. So this may be the one exception to the close loss rule for Nebraska. I think Ohio State is just in a different league than Nebraska, and I don't expect the Huskers to really hang here. There's no history of them always playing OSU tough. There's no even like boogeyman like Indiana, much less a team like Penn State, that's always in the game. And I think every single one of us last week who thought OSU was going to pull away knew that and still thought the talent gap was that big and different. And Penn State, to their credit, showed up and played their best game. I think what Ohio State shows up and plays their best game, Nebraska's in a lot of trouble. And I think the Buckeyes are probably primed after last week to have a, a step forward from what was probably a C-level game for the team against Penn State. Even an Ohio State B-level game is enough to beat Nebraska by multiple touchdowns, and it's not going to be close. So this is one of those games where, you know, talk about hubris, and we all thought they were going to win by bigger than they did last week, and that's fair. People can criticize that. But realistically, looking at these two teams, Ohio State's just way better. And I think every Nebraska fan would admit that, too. It's just Ohio State has way more horses than Nebraska. They have a better quarterback than Nebraska. They have a better defense than Nebraska. They have a better coach than Nebraska. They have a better everything other than fan base outside of Nebraska. And that's just because Nebraska's fans are the nicest fans in college football. So this strikes me as a big Buckeye win. It, I just If it goes any other way, then we start getting a little bit worried about whether we got a little too excited about Rutgers and Maryland and company. Oh, my. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think OSU is going to have a – a game that we all look at and go, yeah, that's about what we expected. Quality insights as usual from Matt Baxendale. You can catch his call on every Sunday on Bucknuts. It is the bucket. Thank you very much, Bax. Thank you to all the listeners out there for tuning in the show. We appreciate that very much. Hope everyone has a great day. Let's hear that Buckeye swag, best damn band in the land. Oh.